The special distance learning for pupils and students of examination classes in the basic and secondary education sectors wraps up with a positive evaluation made by the education buses, the final lessons and guests in this newscast. The armed forces pull that their service, the disposal of the population, their courage and fortitude roll back in security and break down pockets of resistance in security threatened regions. The population is aided to stall the way to the coronavirus as the vulnerable and needy of society are touched by the head of state's special gifts and the benevolence of elites and elected representatives. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Those were the headlines of the 7.30 newscast. Our newscast begins with a distance learning program titled Focus on Exams on CRTV, which has for the last six weeks accompanied pupils of the basic and secondary education sectors. The interactive lessons on radio and television dished out about 200 lectures to examination classes at a time when schools remained closed due to the coronavirus. The Minister of Secondary Education, Professor Nalova Lyonga, watched the closing chapters of the exercise and, of course, she hailed the efforts of the teachers and of CRTV. Beatrice Law Samba tells us more. The studios are classrooms for the last time. Presenters, teachers and the TV crew beam with smiles. The Director General of CRTV Shandongu accompanies the Minister of Secondary Education, Professor Nalova Lyunga, to give them a pass mark as the sprint to the end. Very nice and exciting experience. We were called because uh, we feel that our nation is in trouble with this pandemic school has stopped, uh, what can we do? So that was uh, CRTV in his uh, citizen role. It was six weeks braving the odds to bring 200 lessons to the comfort of homes. This is my little secret. Each time I'm addressing uh, the camera, I just tell myself I'm talking to my kids. So this helped me to uh, keep going and knowing that you are helping kids just like your own, helping kids all over Cameroon. As novel as the novel coronavirus, hashtag focus on exams helped the ministries of basic and secondary education experiment an innovative way of learning. We got on to do something that we had never done before. This is a very great experience and I say CRTV has gone through the test, the teachers have gone through the test and all have passed. It was therefore a successful experiment might become a learning option as the education system develops thick skin against the pandemic. Nobody knows what the situation will be in September. And so it is possible to use this as a means to alleviate, you know, all the problems that we have in our schools with overcrowding. Hashtag exams had over 5,000 questions coming while it lasted. Taking off on June 1 has definitely been made easier with this form of learning. And our guest on the set tonight is the Minister of Secondary Education, whom you just watched there in that report. Good evening, Professor. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now, you me. spoke a little bit on, on that report. It was just a couple of minutes, but now you have the chance to give us an evaluation of this distance learning program, the first on CRTV. The first on CRTV, the first in Cameroon. Uh, as I said before, I was praising everybody who has participated in this program for over a month. And uh, to say that uh, you have three sets of people, you have CRTV itself, you have the teachers, you have the ministry, okay, the two ministries, and all of them were doing this for the first time. And I think that uh, it's worth praising, congratulating everybody who took part in this. What because evaluation do you make of this? I think it's been very good, excellent, as I said, because we did not have a trial period. We just, the uh, director general called me, and as he called me, I was also preparing to call him, I remember, and we do remember that telephone conversation, and all we did was we fixed the date. Okay, we are going to start on this date, and there we go, we started, and it worked out very well. So uh, we are happy to say everybody did their part, and it all went well. How effective do you think this was, given the number of challenges? There are some homes that don't have lights. There are, there are some homes that even don't have a television set. Yeah, 
those problems are there, and that is why we're using all the media possible. It's not just CRTV. You know, it's on social media, which you know the children use quite a lot. So the children are going to have the opportunity to use their phones in the right way. For once, uh, they will be doing something beneficial to them. So this, and those who don't have any of that can have the written scripts. The scripts are uh, in the in the centers. So right now, we're going to try and get all the scripts in all the centers for those who have nothing, but they're just their lamps or something of the sort. Are you by this saying that uh, pupils and parents who do not have a chance to watch these television programs or listen to the radio programs, are you by this saying that they can have the different schools can have these students or these pupils who missed out on this lesson, they can have the, the physical lessons? Of course. Okay. You know, this is not the end of it because every child should be able to have it. So it is there. That's why we're sending it everywhere. And that's why it is on social media as well. And we're sure that the children are going to have it and that they will do well. We're expecting, I mean, let me go even further to say that we're expecting very good results uh, at the GCE this year because they have several opportunities for them to do their revision and to do well. And the, the, the distance learning on CRTV, actually, the end of it actually coincided with uh, the announcement for the tentative resumption of schools on the 1st of June yes. for pupils of examination classes. What can you tell us about this resumption? The resumption is going to be uh, difficult. It's not going to be easy because once again we're coming up with, uh, uh, we're going to face a situation that we have not faced before. Uh, fortunately, we have had to cut down on the number of pupils who will be present in school. That is only those in the examination classes. So that gives us the opportunity to do social distancing uh, because we can now use uh, those teachers who are in the intervening classes and uh, they will be able to do uh, the supervision, etc. And we shall have more classrooms to do that. So because of that, that is going to be easy. And because everybody is enthusiastic to participate and do something positive, you know, everybody is anxious to fight against this virus. I think that is going to be fine because all the parents wish that every child who goes to school come 1st of June is going to be safe. One person who is safe is all Cameroonians who are safe. One person who is sick, one sick person is all Cameroonians who are sick. So for once we are very aware of the fact that there is no room for selfishness, but that everybody must do his part. So it's going to be fine. You know, the basic measures are going to be put there. What are, these, know, what, what are these measures? Those because basic parents, measures. Parents and teachers, as well as the pupils, are scared. We don't want to come back home with COVID-19 in as much as we want to study. So what are some of these measures that you'll be putting at the level of secondary education and why not even basic education to ensure that the pupils and the teachers are safe while they're at school? I will say that people should not be afraid, but rather that people should effect the measures that the Prime Minister is talking about every day almost, so to speak. You know, if you do what you know you're supposed to do, then you should not be afraid. But if you don't do it, as we see on the streets, some people think uh, the coronavirus is just a fake tale, some story that has just come like that. No, 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 no. If we do what we're supposed to do, wear our masks, wash our hands, use hand uh, sanitizers, get all our toilets and everything very clean. You know, as you know, the clean school uh, is, campaign. A, is a campaign is something which we've been doing in, in secondary schools. If you go to some of those secondary schools that are actually doing it, you'll be surprised to see how neat the schools are. So we just continue along these lines and we will be fine. Is there any inspection that your ministry is envisaging before the school resumption to ensure that all schools have water because the children must wash their hands? Yes. Uh, not only that, we're going to have orientation and we'll be working with the ministry of uh, health and uh, also with a lot of our partners by the partners I'm talking uh, UNICEF UNESCO all of these people are working with us so we shall be doing that you know it's really 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 important that we do all this supervision because otherwise we shouldn't send our children to school. And all of this is so that the children can sit in for their final year examinations. So that we don't have a blank One year. month, is it going to be enough for the students to come back after the, after the break and then one month after they sit in for the oh, exams? But you know the reason why CRTV got into this whole business okay. is that we had to warm up 
warm up the house and make sure that the children don't relax and sleep off. It was to make sure that the, student, the students remember that they are at home, but they are in school. So they have been doing it. And when we start on the first, the period is divided in such a way that you have a time for revision. We're going to do revision again. Although they had done 80% of the syllabus, but we're going to start again with revision. Okay. When they do revision, they'll get back to some of the things that they have already done and some of the things that were taught during this time of distance education. So there is no problem the students are, I mean, we've really taken care of them. There is no problem. And I keep saying thank you to the head of state, the type of leader that we have, who is sure that if you lose this generation, you're losing Cameroon. And he was ready. He put some money out for us to be able to do this, even though we're doing distance education for the first time. And all of us know now that it is not as if it is the first time. It's as if we have been doing it for the longest time possible. We just hope that lights will be. We have a problem with lights. Please, we cannot do effective distance education if you, have, if you don't have lights in certain quarters for about two weeks, for about one month. This has happened, but we hope that this will be improved upon. And this comes in the arena of lessons learned. What are some of the lessons you've learned and what are you going to be envisaging with the setbacks? Yes. Well, we're just hoping, we're hoping that the thing about lights will improve. But the problem is that if you don't have lights, no problem, because you're going to be able to go somewhere where you can download this material. And of course, you can go somewhere where you can charge your phone, you know, and have the material in your phone and, and do that. There will be no problem. I think that if the children want to use their phones, they will use it. We have seen what they do with those phones. And as I said, this is the opportunity for them to do the right thing with the phones. So now the parents can buy them all the phones that they want. Your last words, Professor? Well, my last word is that uh, I hope that the government will continue its interest in this and that we can continue to use the experience that CRTV has had and the experience that those teachers who were trained have had so that we can fight this virus again come September because I'm afraid that in September we'll have a bigger and more difficult uh, task because this time it's not just the examination classes, it's, but it's the whole school. So we're having everybody come in, but social distancing has to be observed. How can we do that? Can we use distance education to improve on this situation? I hope we can. It will be important that we do so. Thank you very much, Prof, for being our guest on the 730 News. Thank and you very much. We wish you good luck. I've enjoyed it. Okay, too. right now, pupils and students have been out of school, yes, since government officially halted studies to protect the education community from spreading the coronavirus. And almost two months today, the youth have either been undertaking e lessons or receiving lectures from private teachers. Others have simply resorted to learning a trade or culinary art. Victor Seeger says, for the greater part, these pupils have been far from idle. A yumi cream cake is what sellers and washing and the constant wearing of face masks. The mayors of the five councils in the Mbam and Kim division so are now far. well equipped to fight against the COVID-19 pandemic in their locality. The baking classes are taken here at home and their mother, their teacher. I learned this from my mother. During the confinement period, I taught it wise to transfer it to my children. It can be a source of revenue for them. The pace is set and time to introduce into the oven. Why the cake bakes? We go meet Hilary, a student in a nursing institution who has taken up a temporary hobby, aesthetics. His aesthetics trainer sees potential in the young learner. The same satisfaction shared by the young bakers who savour the works of their hands. Staying away from school hasn't been a waste for these children doing well in these new activities.
We begin our special report with the Cameroon Navy and their rich arsenal that contributes to foster national unity. In the southwest region, the Nautical Assault Company carries out maritime operations. It has a surveyor center, but it also has a training school for sea divers. Ewane Epole tells us more from the southwest. The Nautical Assault Company, Kopalko, based at Isongo in Limbe, is one of the Cameroon's Navy operation center that has a school specialized in the training of sea divers. David School is in charge to train divers, combat divers or swim it combat. And uh, sometimes we have the special requesting for the hierarchy. The hierarchy can ask them, okay, we need you to train 25 people for the special forces in the army. As that, we use a specific equipment and we use to go in some aquatic uh, environment which is different from the from the earth. And the air we breathe is different, and the way we move is also different. According to a Clarence diver, Lieutenant Christophe Dassy, this recompression chamber is used for the medical follow-up of divers. In the domain of maritime operations, the Copalco Navy works with the surveillance unit COSCO. When we have the intelligence from the surveillance center that we have, uh, for instance, pirates around in the seaside, now we have our intervention, our team intervention, we can go over there. Most of the time, what the pirates do is to kidnap people. And now the surveillance center is to follow the route where they are going. Then we can send the team intervention, how you see behind me, to go over there and to free hostages. And here it goes when there is a military operation in the sea. The security situation in the East region, hitherto preoccupying for authorities, is gradually getting stable due to the bravery of defense forces in the area. With the Rapid Intervention Battalion B resolved to roll back insecurity, the phenomenon of highway robbery, kidnappings and cattle theft have been contained. Amidst rebel attacks from the neighboring Central African Republic, Kelvin Bunda reports that the presence of the B is a relief to the population. The East region in terms of security is one of the areas in Cameroon at the moment where people live and move freely with their property and goods all through the day without fear. Proof of this is seen in the huge number of trucks from Douala and other parts of Cameroon that transport goods to the three northern regions and also to neighboring countries like Chad and the Central African Republic passing through Betwa daily. Highway robbery on the national road number one <laughs> linking the eastern region to the three northern regions have been completely eliminated. We put soldiers in the buses to escort travelers leaving the eastern region to the limit with the Adamawa region. And at the limit Adamawa region, we have elements of our neighboring unit, the 5th Rapid Intervention Battalion, who take the relay of the escort right up to Gaoundere. The rebels in the, the past used to cross the border to hide in our country to take hostages. Uh, this phenomenon is over. His Excellency Paul Bia created new brigades, new companies all over the region. New equipment were given to them. Soldiers of the 2nd Rapid Intervention Battalion, true to the motto of the B, have left no space for these men and women of the underworld. We are working in very close condition with the population. Our authorities and provide things like protection, escort, and so on. And then we have a vigilance committee for us because we don't have military base everywhere. Apart from petty theft linked to delinquents, which is common, soldiers of the 2nd Rapid Intervention Battalion are now bent on putting an end to farmer grazer conflicts and the traffic on human remains, which is on the rise. Defense forces throughout the national territory continue to work tirelessly to serve the nation and to uphold the virtues of peace and unity. Tonight, we focus on the special teams for rapid intervention, a C, who have been ensuring that civilians are kept from harm's way. Through the toll-free number 117, they've been able to rescue persons from danger. Constantine Baum reports on the experiences and their contributions to nation-building. 
The company for the security of schools and university institutions came into existence on the 19th of November 2012. It is headed by an operational commander and his deputy. It includes five departments, a support unit, a specialized unit, and three other units in charge of general services. The Central Command for Mobile Intervention Units is in charge of coordinating the activities of the mobile intervention units located at the regional headquarters throughout the national territory. As the name implies, its role consists mainly in the security of academic institutions throughout the entire nation. It is a very challenging role. Therefore, assistance comes at a local level from the mobile intervention units through constant patrols around these institutions and in case of any trouble from within the establishments. Their heads will simply inform the administrative authorities who in turn set in motion the mobile intervention unit of the locality concern. At the national level, the decree setting up the control command of the mobile intervention unit stipulates that only the national police boss, that is the delegate general, for national security can deploy the central command for mobile intervention units. Heads of academic institutions can therefore rest assured now with the putting in place of this new company. Together with other police units already on the field, the company will not spare any efforts in curbing the rising crime wave within the academic milieu. Cameroon's walk to freedom and its zeal to establish a unity within the Concert of Nations has been quite long. It spans from a German protectorate, an Anglo-French condominium, through a British and French mandate, and their trust territory under the United Nations. In the following report, Charles Ibonet unravels the key events of the post-1960 era, which mark the sense of national unity today. 11 February 1961, here then Southern Cameroon's votes in the United Nations supervised plebiscite, one of the key events for the construction of Cameroon unity with the birth of the 10-year lasted Cameroon Federation, which emerged from the constitutional work of the five-day Fumban Conference. I would like to assure you that we of the other sector... The almost 60 years ago dealings marked the closure of roughly 80 years of foreign experience coinage of today's Cameroon. Après plus de 40 années de séparation, nous reformons aujourd'hui une même famille. On May 6, 48 years ago, Federal Republic of Cameroon President Amadou Aijo informed the 120 Federal Assembly the desire to cement national unity with the legal establishment of a United Republic of Cameroon, passing through the May 20, 1972, favorably voted referendum with one trademark, the National Day formulation. Que ce jour heureux soit un jour d'allégresse pour tous les Camerounais qui croient en leur pays. To completely deal with colonial influence, the country's second president, Paul Beard, threw a parliamentary bill as a constitutional prerogative ushered the country into simply the Republic of Cameroon nominative some 36 years ago. The construction of the Cameroonian unity space is a long walk to a belonging. The East and West Cameroon fusion, the deadly political and economic upheavals 30 years ago, the Bakasi Tosu, the terrorism challenge in the far north, and today the breakaway sentiments in the northwest and southwest regions. Through the able leadership of its leaders, the country has been able to interpret itself to fit Cameroon into the context of Bill Clinton's first inaugural address, Cameroon must change, but not change for change's sake, change to preserve Cameroon's oneness, although the country matches to the music of its time, Cameroon's mission is timeless. And now on to one of the factors uniting Cameroon, Banga, a locality in the Mongo division, harbors a railway line that links the French-speaking part of the country to Kumba in the English-speaking part. Unfortunately, the railway line has been shut down since the Ezeka train derailment in 2016. There's, however, a ray of hope, as as false Abongwe tells us, that government plans to relaunch the Mbanga-Kumba railway line. 
a shadow of itself. In four words, this is the vivid description of the Mbanga railway station today. Before 2016, it served as takeoff point to Kumba in the southwest region. Thousands of farmers and business persons from both ends of the country converged and survived around the Mbanga railway station. We live, uh, we take it from Kumba to come and sell it. It is not the same situation since the shutdown of the infrastructure in 2016 following the tragic catastrophe that occurred in Ezeka. We residents of Mbanga are sick because the closure of this station is a serious cost on the economy of small farmers along the railway. Herbs and garbage now envelop the Mbanga railway station, yet this does not empty it from its national importance as engraved in the stones of time. It's the symbol of the reunification of the two Cameroons. Government announces plans of relaunching the railway line in the nearest future to further consolidate this national unity. The Mbangakumba stretch, which is part of our history and embodies part of our company's treasured patrimony, will be relaunched soon. When this goes on the way, economic activities that have gone into hibernation will certainly get on the rail, and the Mbangakumba line will once again regain its lost glory. A traditional outfit that has been quite trendy over the years for the female folk is the Kabangondo from the Sour Culture Zone. The classic long garments, usually stitched on African fabric and decorated to suit the taste of the customer dates as far back as the 19th century. Gerald Nanji Eyambe reports that the Kabangondo has transcended boundaries and is now a regular club for women from all localities. Kabangundo, a regalia from the Sawa land, one of four of the cultural zones in Cameroon, is today an epitome of national identity. Patricia Nganju, an elite of West Region, is patronizing this enviable outfit through sewing and sales. <laughs> like her, Winifred Akucho from the Northwest Region is also a promoter. It's a dress. When you put it on, you yourself you feel responsible. You are you feel good inside. So the occasions when I want to go, I wear kabangondo. It makes me look responsible. Traditional wedding, you going to church, you wear kabangondo, you look responsible in it. The prices begins as from five thousand to, to, to depending on how the kaba is being done and the fabric of which the kaba is being uh, done with. The kabangondo, which remains a representation of the country's rich cultural repertoire is solicited by many. It's not only now for Sawa, everybody is interested in wearing kabangondo. Even young girls, they wear kabangondo. Mothers, they wear kabangondo. There are men who come to buy kaba for their wives, for their mothers, for their children, and also there are ladies who come to buy. As a Cameroonian, whether you are from South, from East, from North, wherever you are, Put on we are all Cameroonians. This only goes to buttress the fact that Cameroonians are a common people with a common destiny, bound to live together no matter their regions of origin. On to COVID-19 news. As government extends the implementation of barrier measures by 15 days, the fight against the coronavirus in communities is becoming more and more collective. One of such examples is the elite of Upper Sanaga Division who have raised some 18 million CV friends to check the spread of the pandemic. Beyond the financial package, hygiene kits and face masks were handed over to the eight subdivisions of the area. Emmanuel Lamvenue was in Nanga Eboku for the event. Here's a report. Of the over 18 million CFA francs raised by all the elite and vital forces of the Upper Sanaga Division, a little over 10 million CFA francs will go into the National Solidarity Fund, while eight friends has been given to the local committee set up to manage the crisis at the divisional level. Aside this financial package is a consignment of hygiene items and face masks distributed to the eight subdivisions for onward transmission to the beneficial population. Described as a concerted effort of the Upper Sanaga in accompanying the head of state to keep the spread of the pandemic at bay, the SDO for the Upper Sanaga has called for its efficient use. To let the population take care, not to be affected by the coronavirus. It is uh, something 
meeting which uh, uh, must be uh, celebrated. I'm encouraging the, all the populations to, to go ahead and use them properly. Time for the officials of the division, starting from the mayor of Nangai Boko, Romain Roland Eto, to the representative of the elite of the division, Senator Jean Marie Pongmoni, to heal the efforts of everyone who chipped in their quota to raising this amount. He saluted the Minister of State, Secretary General at the Presidency of the Republic, Ferdinand Gongo, and the Minister of Culture, Bidunquat, for their ever ready move in the development of the division. There's been a slow pace of recoveries from COVID-19 in the last few days in the country. On the contrary, the number of infections keep rising and these figures are recorded by the team of the Public Health Emergency Operations Centre. Tonight we talk about the quality of face masks worn by Cameroonians, which could be blamed for these infections. Baldwin Summer is at the centre and now provides insight into this very worrying issue. Hello Baldwin. Good evening, Esther. Welcome to the Public Health Emergency Operations Center, where, as it was, just as it was the case yesterday, it's the same scenario this Saturday evening, where no case of recovery uh, from COVID-19 has been confirmed in Cameroon this Saturday evening. On the contrary, public health experts of the Public Health Emergency Operations Center uh, told us this evening that uh, there has been an increase in the number of persons infected with uh, COVID-19 in the country, and they just wish to remind Cameroonians that uh, this illness is a new one and uh, there is a little there's still a lot of research being carried out to get to know more as to how this uh, virus is spread and to and equally how Cameroonians can avoid being infected with the virus and one of the ways that Cameroonians uh, are fighting against the spread of COVID-19 um, is the wearing of a face mask and tonight with our resource person Dr. Eric Tanzi we wish to look at the quality of a good face mask and how it should be worn. Good evening, doctor. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, tell us, we have many uh, masks for different qualities in our society today. How should a good mask look like? What are the qualities of a good face mask and how should it be worn? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, before I get to your question, I want to thank Cameroonians who have bothered to continue using the face masks each time they are going out from their home as recommended by the government. And again, for those who have not started using these face masks, we want to still call on them to take it very serious. And then getting to the fact of what are the qualities of a good mask, I think here is very, very clear. But we should specify here that uh, we have two different environments where masks could be used. Here we base on a uh, hospital environment where there is specificity and then we have the community environment as well, just like what is happening today. But to be very specific, I want to get here that in the context of COVID-19, which is the case, a good mask should be the one that can prevent virus inhalation to at least 95% guarantee or assurance, which therefore means that it should be able to protect each and every one to a certain degree because it's difficult to have a 100%. How should a face mask be worn and for how long should that face mask be worn? Yeah, thank you. You know, uh, there are different forms or different uh, brands of face masks. There is the ones that look like a cup. There are ones that come flat. But then the way we need to put it is you feed it quite well on your face, you know, just like what you and I are putting, because it has a band. But others, there is a rope that you need to tie. And then others, like I said, it has a cup-like shape. But we've had situations where, uh, due to community production, people have tend not to use these face masks very well. Let me first of all say the maximum time that we need to use a face mask is three hours and then we need to replace, but we've seen in our communities, people go for more than three hours or the whole day and without even washing. That poses a lot of health threat to the population, even more. And again, we want to specify here that these face masks that we're using, especially in a pandemic like what we're having now, we have to be very careful on how we use it. But before getting to that detail, we should know that using a face mask is not guaranteed to prevent us completely. Other measures have to be followed, like hand washing and even social distancing. 
like the physical distance you and I will having now is what is very principal. And to wear the face, this face mask, you need to fit it well to cover your nose and your mouth and then get it under the chin. And not what we are seeing in our communities nowadays where people are tending now to be chin masks or some have even tended to be pocket masks or even just hanging it on the ear. It has become now a kind of ambience within the community. But we have to be very, very careful that once taking out the face mask, we we'll carefully use the rope to take it out, you know. And then if it is the disposable type, look for a suitable waste bin and drop this inside. But if it is a community-made one where you have to wash, use the appropriate detergent. You dip it inside and you wash it clearly. And then now you can reuse, but making sure you respect all conditions that have been prescribed along with the government. I want to specify here that uh, the population should know that it is not only face masks that prevent us from COVID, it is doing it or accompanying it with other measures that have been prescribed by the government. And there should be no fear. We should keep on using this and make it part of our culture for now because we are in a pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Eric Tandy, for always being available as a resource person. Esther, public health experts use this opportunity to remind Camunians, especially those with uh, symptoms of COVID-19, to discourage this issue of a fear phobia, not to stay at home and get themselves treated individually at home. If you have any symptoms, you move over and get yourself screened in any of these hospitals. The take home message from here tonight is that there is no case of recovery from COVID-19 in Cameroon this Saturday evening. Back to you, Esther Kima. Thank you very much, Baldwin. And it is imperative to continue sensitizing on the proper use of face masks. The head of state's special gift to the population of Manu Division in the Southwest region has been apportioned with emphasis laid on the most vulnerable as beneficiaries. The gifts were handed over to the four subdivisional heads by the first assistant senior divisional officer for Manu, Mr. Melo Zachary. Bridget Ndiap Asam B1 has the details from the Southwest. Comprising hand washing buckets, soap, hand sanitizers, and many other items, the gifts donated by the head of state, President Paul Bia, arrived in Manu Division for the benefit of communities in the four subdivisions. Handing over the gift to the divisional officers in the presence of the mayors, the Manu administration reiterated a judicious use of the items. We will follow up to make sure that those gifts presented by the head of state should be used judiciously and it should go to the vulnerable population that it was meant for them. We'll make a follow-up right up to the grassroots. The gifts, according to the Divisional Officer for Manfe Central, are to boost and reinforce the respect of barrier measures put in place by the government. We have put in place another committee in charge with uh, the distribution of these gifts. We have been meeting before today in order to select the beneficiary following the instruction from the hierarchy. Given that the divisional officers have been working with municipal authorities in sensitizing the populations on the coronavirus, the presidential gifts will reach the appropriate beneficiaries and help to curb the spread of the pandemic in Manu Division. In Bam and Kim Division, the senators of the Centre Region have reached out to the population with the consignment of sanitary gadgets as their contribution to bar the way to COVID-19. The president of the group, Senator Sylvestre Naondoa, gave the gadgets, including over 100 shares destined for the five cancels of Mbam and Kim. Meanwhile, the population of Akonolinga have received consignments of presidential kits to help fight the virus. Details in this joint report by Ibude Ekane and Maimon Anjoya of sanitary kits from the head of state at the esplanade of the Akonolinga town hall was marked by an open warning from the SDO of the Nyong and Fumu. I want to insist, to emphasize concerning the responsibility. We should go ahead with the observing of the measure taken by the government in order to put far away uh, this disease. 
the implication of council executives of Akonolinga and the presence of representatives of some health centers in the locality justified the ongoing proximity strategy to raise awareness on basic rules as hand washing and the constant wearing of face masks. The mayors of the five councils in the Mbam and Kim division are now well equipped to fight against the COVID-19 pandemic in their locality. They have received a consignment of gifts from the senators of the central region comprising 125 chairs as well as cartons of laundry soap, buckets, hand sanitizers, disinfectants and face masks. We have come here with some gifts to fight against this pandemic called COVID-19. With the newly constructed bridge over the river Nashtigar, which now facilitates the movement of people and their goods, the population is expected to be vigilant more than ever before to bar the way to the coronavirus in that locality. The senators all receive a symbolic gift comprised of a fly whisk and a cap as a symbol of authority. In religious news, Muslim faithful across the nation have begun the last phase of the month of fasting, prayer and reflection. A few days to go, the faithful remain pious and assess the ninth month of the Islamic calendar, which has been quite a challenge due to the coronavirus. Although prayer schedules have been altered and communion procedures changed, they say it has not hindered in any way their spiritual growth. Romeo Nkenye tells us more. Less than a week to the end of the month of Ramadan, Muslim faithful have been using the previous days to intensify prayers of forgiveness to Almighty Allah. Fasting has also been a moment of reconciliation and pardon amongst believers. Praying under strict respect of measures to bar the way to the spread of the coronavirus at the Tinga Islamic Complex and the Yaoundé Central Mosque, home prayers have been encouraged as the crescent moon is highly awaited. For these last days, we Muslims pray in the evening in the mosque. Fasting this year has not witnessed the same effervescence like in the previous years due to the current health crisis. We are in the last 10 days now, so now we are waking up in the night around 1 o'clock to 3. We are praying. So that's what we are doing right now. As Muslims look forward with optimism to breaking their fast, they are enjoined to maintain the good practices of Islam even after the feast. It is purported that the 2018 presidential candidate Prophet of Franklin Zifo Afangui is no more. It is reported that the flag bearer of the Cameroon National Citizen Movement and general overseer of the Kingship International Ministries died today in Douala. His followers, however, say he is only on a spiritual retreat. Rene Kache tells us more. In the name of the living God. Yeah. These are Christians of Kingship Ministry. They are all on their knees praying and invoking the intervention of the Almighty God to raise their spiritual leader and prophet, Franklin Defoe Afanwi, from dead. The popular man of God and candidate at the 2018 presidential election has been declared dead by the medical corps. Dr. Gail Nanga is the medical doctor who declared him dead with symptoms of the COVID-19 pandemic. The health practitioner explains that his team got an alert from the family of Prophet Franklin Ndifoa Fanwi and immediately rushed to the victim's Bonaberry residence. Family members would send the medical doctor out of the residence, denying access to everyone, including authorities and law enforcement officers. Moments later, the attorney general appears at the scene and the gate is open. Due medical preparations to evacuate the body of the politician have been made, but the family insists no one can get access into the room where the remains are found. As for this Christian who had a rendezvous with the prophet for a healing, she would probably have to wait a little more for a biblical miracle. Elsewhere, there's been a fire incident at the campsite building of Hippodrome Yaoundé. Fortunately, no deaths have been recorded and there reportedly no serious injuries as well. The building went ablaze at about 11.45 a.m. today and according to the quick response team on the site, the fire was triggered by poor electrical connections. Alice Mbe has the details. It was at exactly 11.45 a.m. this morning when the fire incident broke out at the seventh floor of the Jongolo residence in Yaoundé. Eyewitness accounts say the fire is said to have been caused by some poor electrical connections. 
I was sitting in the parlor with my son and hairdresser. Out of a sudden, I noticed the building started shaking while we were talking. Smoke filled the house. We went to the veranda attempting to jump. Other neighbors told us to use the stairs, which we did. With the rapid intervention of the 10th Fire and Rescue Battalion for Mimboman, Van and Karifu Wada, they succeeded in putting off the fire. The Director General of the Low Cost Houses, Dr. Amadou Sadauna, immediately rushed to the site. While I was working with my directors, we saw smoke coming out from this direction. So we came down to see what was happening. We, the technicians and owner of this apartment have been told to carry out a general check-up of the building. Security men patrol the area to ensure the safety of all. No deaths were recorded. And that ends this 45-minute newscast. More news comes up at 8.30 p.m. with Karin Olivia Bitt. I'll be back again tomorrow. Good willing. Good night and stay tuned to our programs on CRTV. CRTV News, ici, toute l'info.